morning, brothers and sisters. The Lord welcomes you to this gathering. Also, those who are here as guests are welcome. Our pre-service song is number 314. The Lord calls us to worship in the words of Psalm 9. <clears throat> I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at your presence. For you have maintained my right and my cause. You sat on the throne judging in righteousness. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. O enemy, destructions are finished forever. And you have destroyed cities. Even their memory has perished. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall administer judgment for the peoples in righteousness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Let us now prepare our hearts as we come into the Lord's presence with a moment of silent prayer. Our opening hymn is number 327.
call upon the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now, at this time, submit ourselves to the Ten Words of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to, a thousand, to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. With repentant hearts, we turn to the Lord, and we also look there from his word to be reassured that indeed his grace and his mercy is upon us, despite how often we, we break the commandments of the Lord. And it is a cause for uh, thankfulness and a struggle in our lives to continue to do what the Lord asks of us. But we know that Jesus Christ has fulfilled um, the demands of that same law. And uh, we'll listen then to um, the Word of God as, as that speaks to us exactly in that way in the well-known words of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. 
The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquity. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. So far a reading, Psalm 103. Let us now sing hymn number 32, the first, second, and third stanzas. Let us now unite in prayer. Eternal, merciful God and Father, we have drawn nigh to you. The morning of this day of rest, this first day of the new week, and we may start with worship. Not with work, but with worship. Knowing, Father, that all things in our lives, you have provided for. You provided for our daily needs. And more than that, we work for the things that we have each day. Uh, they are given to us, entrusted to us. And we thank you, Father, for showing us that you are indeed a faithful God and Father, more faithful than our earthly parents can be, you are faithful to us with your promises, your covenantal promises, promise that you will be our God, calling us then to, to worship you and to live for you. And may we in this way, Father, um, fulfill our covenant obligations as well. We are here, Father, as, as families and in the unity of faith. To worship you this morning, we ask that you also grant to each of us open heart, a listening ear. When your word is open and it is also proclaimed, we pray that you will bless each and every one as to our needs. We may hear from your word and it may uh, indeed quicken the heart. We pray also for those who could not be here. We ask that you be with them as well and provide them all that they stand in need of this day. And if uh, there was not that desire to be here, then also the change of heart that is needed for that. Will you work it so that we may more and more be united and come to unity of, of faith and expression. We thank you that you've blessed uh, brother and sister Faber with a baby girl this past week. I also hope to see ministration of the sacrament this afternoon, service. We pray that you will bless this family with this new addition and grant them the wisdom to bring her up in the fear of your holy name. Father, be with us now and 
graciously forgive where we have fallen short of the mark in serving you. Forgive us our sins and hear our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. morning we open the scriptures and we turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, Cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. Now whatever city or town you enter, Inquire who is in it worthy, and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore do not fear them, For there is nothing covered 
that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, whatever conf whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me, follow after me, is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only, only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. In preparation for this morning's uh, sermon, let us sing number 93.
The text for this morning's uh, sermon is found with our reading of Matthew chapter 10, the verses 34 to 39. We'll repeat that. We'll read them again. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we live in a world that is much divided, one man against another. We're reminded again that all is not peace with the ongoing struggles, for instance, in Palestine. It doesn't take much to get things going, and when it does, it's, it's a terrible thing. We see it also in closer to home divisions, even in our own country, um, east and west, have provinces and not have provinces. We see struggles in our own neighborhood. One doesn't always get along with the neighbor, and sometimes it, it can be bitter. And we see it also with in the families. We see that struggle that takes place which separates um, parents from children. And we say it's a horrible thing. And indeed it is. Is it any wonder that so much effort is, is made to try to find more peaceful means locally, familially, but also in the broader spectrum of world events? And we see some success, sworn enemies, have become trading partners, allies even. And of course, there's always that thought behind what's going on in the world, people thinking, now how can we make this a better place? Can someone be found who can bring that, that lasting peace? Sometimes the President of the United States is looked upon as, as perhaps that man, as, as being a world leader. And then to realize again, he's human, and it doesn't always come to what one had hoped for. The children of Israel in the Old Testament lived with a dream that an individual would come, prophesied by the word of God, who would bring peace to his people. Many of the prophets spoke of him. Perhaps one who spoke the most of him was Isaiah. He has many chapters in which he writes about the coming of the Messiah. Um, chapter 9, one of the famous chapters, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and peace, there will be no end. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This same person was also promised later on to a young woman and her husband, or soon-to-be husband. And God said to the latter, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, 
because he will save his people from their sins. Save. Yeah. That's, if that's not peaceful, what is? Thirty years after his birth, when he had come into his ministry, he opened his mouth and he spoke to the people of God. And we've read that chapter this morning, how that all started. What did he say? The Prince of Peace, what did he say? Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to this earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. These were the words uttered by the one of whom it was foretold would bring peace to this earth. We all know the Christmas story. The angel, what they said to the shepherds. What to make of this peace that was to come by means of his ministry? Those are the questions we hope to answer this morning, congregation. We've heard enough already to know that the way of his peace is not a standard and acceptable understanding of how that peace might be according to the thoughts and hopes of men. But we will listen and we will learn. For as we hope to hear this morning, peace does come through him and through him alone. I claim to you this morning the word of our Lord as we find that with our text under the following theme and head. The way to peace comes by the sword. We'll see in the first place, all is not as it appears. Secondly, taking up the cross to follow Christ no matter what. First of all, then, all is not as it appears. We've come this morning to what Scripture calls a mashal. It's a Hebrew word, mashal. And it means a paradoxical saying, one that sounds unbelievable and contrary to the prevailing opinion of men. And how that is so well it's not that the people of Israel would have been shocked if he had only said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Many, including the disciples, had long awaited a Messiah who would come and chase the Romans from the land by the sword just before Jesus was taken captive. Brought to trial, Peter took the sword and would have hewn his way all the way to the coronation of Christ on the throne in Jerusalem. And so the way of peace was not without the idea of the sword. To gain peace, as you know, may often take the need to, to fight, to take the sword. But that Jesus addressed the people of Israel in this way, he immediately added... For I have come to turn a man against his father, daughter against her mother, and so forth. That will have had the effect of startling each and every one in shock disbelief. Was this not Jesus, the one who pronounced blessings on those who lived to make peace in the Sermon on the Mount? What of the peace passages of Psalm 72, which allude to him? Luke 1. Romans 5, Ephesians 2, Hebrews 6. Don't have time to read them all. Do not all these passages, however, among others, many others, proclaim in the strongest of terms that Jesus is seen as the bringer of peace. How then could he bring a message of dividing up who on other occasions he spoke of as wanting to heal and to, to unite. 
We're called this morning, brothers and sisters, as we said, to observe the Mashal as it seeks to place emphasis on one aspect of the truth as it does not necessarily agree with what we hold as universally valid on other occasions. Hold universally valid as to the role of the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 34, Jesus says concerning the swearing of an oath, I'm just using some examples here to show you uh, the Mashal-like effects of, of Jesus' preaching. Concerning those swearing an oath, he says, Do not swear at all, either by heaven, nor for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, etc., etc. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Then the purpose of Jesus saying this is not to exclude all oaths, but the reason that he says it the way he does is to stop a person short in his tracks and to make him think, think on an aspect of how this can be true over against what is universally valid in every other instance, that there is a, a place for this sort of thing. I think of the incident of, of the water made into wine at Cana by Jesus, where the mother of Jesus, that is Mary, said to Jesus, they have no wine. And how does Jesus respond to that? He responds by saying to his mother, O oh woman, what have you to do with me? Shocking. And yet there's a truth in that. I think of another incident where Jesus is confronted by his family. A crowd said to Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied and said, who are my mother and my brothers? Again, these words of Jesus stood in contrast to the universally valid truths because that in one particular way, shockingly, Jesus wants to stop the people in their tracks so that they might know what is also true. Jesus came to this world not to conform to its ways, not to consider the opinions of men as first and foremost, but in fact to challenge them. And that's why he speaks as he does. It's indeed shocking. It goes against the grain of all that is held as universally true. It rubs the fur backwards, so to speak. The question that we need to ask then is, why does Jesus do this? How, in fact, does he justify doing this? Is he not a contrarian? Is he not, in some instances, disrespectful, like to his mother and to his family? At first, we might think so. Our first reaction is indeed one of disbelief. We say to ourselves, Jesus is not right to say this. It flies in the face of what is expounded by Scripture and what is of custom and what is decent. The enemies are to perish by the sword. Yeah, they can understand that. But the members of a household, the children of Israel... Surely not. How could Jesus say this? I don't understand. Indeed, we don't. Quite often, we don't. But brothers and sisters, and Jesus has also worked the proper effect. This is indeed what he wants the people who hear him to think. But now the question is, why does he do that? Jesus Christ's use of the element of the sword in our text is what presents us with the mashal. As long as man has lived on this earth, lived in sin, the sword has been seen as a symbol of destruction, negative destruction. It is a sword which rather than give, gives life, takes it. The symbol as such is not very favorable, but that's exactly 
That's exactly why Jesus uses it. Beloved, what we need to understand this morning, what Jesus presents us with a mashal, is that there must of necessity be a tremendously important truth in need of being conveyed that comes with this utterance. And that is the ultimate purpose of the mashal. We're called to hear with it that which is the greatest of truths, and yet it's one that is not always perceived by us as first and foremost. The call of a mother to a son asking him to make wine or to step out of a very dangerous situation can be universally seen as, as favorable. That's what we expect of our parents. And so we have more difficulty with Christ seemingly denying the response his mother wants. So it is that when society has long seen the sword as a symbol of oppression, especially so in the time and the ministry of Christ, when Romans ruled and suppressed God's people, then it becomes difficult to readily accept Christ using that very symbol in order to underline the ultimate purpose of his ministry to namely to divide his own people. Christ says, people, while you live on this earth, in this present situation, you as my followers must expect the sword. Yes, the very opposite of peace will be the truth for your lives. And in that persecution, will be the order of the day. And why? Brothers and sisters, it is only in this way that it will become evident as to who is of the Lord and who is not. It is only in this way that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. The entrance of Christ into this world has been for the purpose of splitting things apart, brothers and sisters. What is true creates a division between one and the other. Why is that? Why does it create division? Well, because that's how things are in this world. It's not as peaceful as you imagine. And all who seek for peace are not as intent on finding the true peace as perhaps for selfish reasons. And yes, we may all want peace. We don't want war. We don't want to die. But we're not in the first place here as congregation to talk about physical fighting, struggles between mother and children, mother and father and children, or vice versa, or wars in this world between one race and another race. We're here to talk about that which is a reality for all who live, spiritual reality, namely that struggle which was marked right at the beginning of our history, that struggle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And that's an ongoing struggle, brothers and sisters, that we have to realize is taking place. The thing is we often only look at ourselves. We look at, at our present situation and perhaps we're doing quite well uh, financially. We're enjoying life. No struggles as we know takes place in other parts of the world. And we like to think that our relationship as much as there can be struggles in our family. Overall it's, it's it's relatively good. Sure, there are exceptions. There are exceptions. But when it comes to the question of faith, brothers and sisters, 
Where do you stand? Are you still seeing that warfare that needs to be waged because of what you believe in? You realize what is happening in our society in which the church has to tolerate the, the onslaught of the things which are happening in this world that we are not recognized and left alone, but that there is this insidious work of Satan to try to break our families apart. That that struggle which God spoke of in paradise with Adam and Eve is still an ongoing thing. And we cannot take our foot off the pedal, so to speak, because what is taking place can be fatal. So beware of setting store on our earthly existence as if it is an end in itself, brothers and sisters, and of you boys and girls. To hold what you have because of what you have and so cherish it can be the greatest danger that there is to your existence. Things can already be in motion, which you might think is just matter of fact, which are leading to a, a dis destruction of your family. It's happening despite taking up that sword. No, it's not that we're we're fighting with, with, with sword in hand. But there is a call for it in the spiritual sense. We see so many nice relationships and we, we're sometimes encouraged by how we see our neighbor who is not Christian, how he lives with his fellow man. And we're inclined with Louis Armstrong to say, and I say to myself, what a wonderful world. That Jesus came into this world to stir things up with the truth of heaven. And that nice friend you may think you have, perhaps raised with the same values, whose, in whose presence you feel warm, he or she sometimes can be beyond nice. But if he or she does not belong to Jesus Christ, there's a danger. And Jesus says, I've come to bring division there. And so to shock you into standing still and asking, well, what is it you have come to do and say, Jesus? What must I do to truly follow you on the road to salvation? I have come there. Jesus says, to divide a husband from his wife and a child from his parent. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? But it is as loving as love can get on this earth. Congregation. We have but to learn to understand the truth. My loving my wife and my children does not in itself bring about salvation. The universal truth, indeed the Christian truth, is that I must love them. But this does not assure salvation. Indeed, if my love in the end blinds me towards them, as when they no longer want to serve the Lord, that I end up going along with them out of this so-called love, more than that I listen to the word of God calling me away to repentance, then my love for my wife and my mother and my father will not bring me to the right place. We need to be redeemed and saved through the blood of Jesus Christ alone. That's what ultimately counts in this life. That's why this earth continues to exist as God calls people from every time and place. For with him lies salvation. Yes, there is salvation. Do you dream that it's just this life and then it's over? No, God has offered a way out for us. He's offered us life eternal. But beware. Beware then of how you live. Beware of who you serve. 
Who are you serving? Do you expect eternal life if all of your days have been working for Satan? Do you think that's who God rewards? So the reason for the, that the sword finds its meaning and usage with Christ is because of the reality of sin. It may sound harsh to hear Jesus use these words. We may ask, is he not the Prince of Peace? Indeed he is. But what is the reality of this life? Does it allow me to acknowledge him as the Prince of Peace? All of mankind, left to their own, are bent on destruction. That includes you and me. It may be a nice gesture at any other time for Father to suggest that we stay home and go to the beach. That may be at the end of the day. May at the end of the day leave us a nice warm feeling. Oh, tonight when Dad comes back from work, we're going to go to the lake for supper and sit by the water or go for a holiday for a week. We anticipate all the nice things that can happen there, and, and why not? It's beautiful. But why is it Jesus might say to that, I'm going to bust that up. I'm going to cut into that with the sword of the word. He might say that over against what is universally accepted if the day happens to be Sunday, and you have the call to be in church at exactly those suggested moments that Father imposes on his children, calling them to the beach. While Jesus dwelt on this earth, don't forget, he had no place to lay his head because the serpent was after the church to destroy him and it by whatever means at his disposal. You know where you're living? Do you think that all is nice and quiet in our society, in our schools, the workplace, and what have you? For you to think that there is no danger is to fall and fail to see the element of the need for a sword. You may readily send your children out into the world without having fear. But are you still able to discern what is right and what is wrong when you do? Do you have an eye for the place of the sword in your family life? You know how it went before the flood? The sons of Seth and father of the church, went and married the sons of Cain. And all was seen to be at peace. Finally, we got it figured out. No, I don't come with your prophecy of water and, and doom. Don't talk to us about the necessity of the sword, so to speak. All is at peace now. Now that we found each other as seed of the serpent, seed of the woman, what have we been fighting for all these years? But, brothers and sisters, not one of them was saved. The flood came and destroyed them all because the evil was so great in all of that love and peace. God introduced the sword. Because the truth of the matter was that his people were being slain by the sword of the evil one. And so God saved the remnant before it was too late. Come to the second point, taking up the cross to follow Christ. The sword of which Christ speaks is the one that takes up the fight of faith. You must apply it, brothers and sisters. You must take the word of God as that sword, and apply it. And consider it as serious. He who loves father and mother more than me, Jesus says, is not worthy of me. He who loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. How many of us, how many 
of us who do not know of those who have, rather than serve the Lord, served a partner? How many marriages don't start that way? It's all the good intentions. You loved her so much you just squeezed her to death before you married her. Later you wish you had. Because you're not one in faith. And all the good intentions ultimately sees you who lack the sword going in the way of the world. And it's good to know that beforehand. And you better know it beforehand. Know what you're doing. Know what the word of God says. And this is not meant to be offensive over against the, that boy or girl you may be going with. It's, it's reality. Because the way of the evil one is subtle. He makes everything look like ev all is well. But in the end, you're standing on the outside and wondering what happened. Hopefully you wonder what happened so you can turn back. Many of them don't ever turn back. And they find it in this life and they say it's beautiful. It's nice Sunday just to go for a drive out in the country and go to the beach. And it is nice in itself. But have you clouded issues? Do you no longer see your call is here? Not just once, twice. Because God calls you that through his sophistry. Calls you to be here. Do you answer to the truth of sin? Does it still mean something to sin? Or is that becoming easier too? If your son therefore rebels and use the power of the sword, the word of God, use it against him. Not to, to kill him, but let him know that there is a warfare situation that he has created in seeking to go into drugs or booze or sexual immorality. Understand things right, father and mother. Don't just say, oh, I was once like that. Let me wait and it will be okay. It will pass. Sin destroys more than any physical sword has ever done. You realize that? More than all the wars in this world. Satan seeks to dislodge you. You know what you're doing. I know the world can look like a very pleasant place. At times, you can have a lot of fun. we're being fought against. And the sooner we realize that, the better in our families and in our church. We're being fought against. And in, Satan doesn't let up. Those moments you think are neutral, many of them aren't neutral, but he is fiercely looking to get a hold of you at that very moment. You can let everything fly in the wind, so to speak. Ah, it's not as bad as you say it is, minister. I'm not an extreme person at all. I'm sure many of you aren't either. But it's so easy to say okay to things that should not be said okay to. Especially, think of that young parents of upcoming teenagers or those who are in their teens. When they have the ability to do things on their own and greater independence, realize what's going on. Don't be afraid to confront them, but do so in a way of wisdom. There may be a time when you say, yes, I've I've done something wrong. I wouldn't harp on things of the past as much as that, you know, they may say you did something wrong 
uh, last week or yesterday, then owe up to it and say it to your, your children. Don't be afraid to communicate and show that you too are uh, human, that you too can sin. And say sorry, because that's the way. That's the way we want to go. That's, that's the path we're on. Say sorry to sin and fighting against it. But respect your parents nevertheless. They've been given to be an authority over you because of their experience of life. And they have more than you do, I know. It's not always easy to think that way. What do they know? We know it all. No, they've been given, especially where they're, they've been given some wisdom, they're there to help you in this ongoing struggle. And that's where we uh, need to be. We need to take up the cross of Christ, no matter what, no matter what the situation may be. Take up the cross. It's not heavy. He's done the heavy work. It's light. But he's taken away uh, the power of sin to condemn us. He's taken that away. Bring them into the beauty of, of the peace which God has given us in Jesus Christ. Indeed, he is the Prince of Peace. There is no other but him. But the, the way is, nevertheless, in that situation where there's that ongoing struggle, his way is also the way of the sword. He will divide. He comes to divide. He comes to say what is right and what is wrong. And go, follow him. Follow him to his holy word. And God will bless you and your families. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come and thank you that you've given us your word and you've called us once again to the truth of your word, the truth of the Prince of Peace, that he is there to fight for us and to deliver us from all evil, and for that he has taken the sword. And may it, as a mashal, also speak to us and, and that it shocks us, says, uh, yes, there is that aspect that we must not ever overlook, a very important part, that indeed the struggle continues on. And as such, he didn't come to bring peace for those who uh, were thinking they had peace, but he came to bring a sword so that the true peace might be revealed. Father, we pray, work it in our hearts to understand, help us in our families to live this truth, Give us courage as parents to teach our children and give the respect as children to our parents for the thing they are doing are of the Lord. Father, be with us further this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing number 176, the first, second, third, and fourth stanzas.
us pray. Father in heaven, we ask you also to bless the offering that we bring. There's many things that we do as church to provide aid to others who need that. This morning for the Bible League as they continue their work of bringing the gospel to uh, the nations. We pray that this work may bring much success in bringing people to the Lord, giving them a look, insight into the wonderful gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. And bless those who work and do this work and also with your Holy Spirit, bless it all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. the Lord. Now lift up our hearts to the Lord, receive his blessing, and depart in his peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Our song of praise to close the service, number 84, the first, second, and third stanzas, God is our refuge and our strength. 